Hey guys, welcome to Bledsoe Said So. I see you waving over there in the back, Nick. <laughs> I'm excited we, to see everybody in the in the virtual world. Likewise. I mean, we can't see anybody, but you know. I'm pretending, man. I'm imagining I can see them. Yeah, we can, can feel, feel them. them. Yeah. We can hear there you them. Go. So tonight we have Mike Clellan with us. Mike and I go way back. We've known each other. I can't put my finger quite on it. It's close to 10 years now. I feel like it's eight to nine years. 2013. Yeah. 10 years. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Right 10, around, 10 years. Right yeah. around spring. It was right around this time of year. So it might be 10 years to the day. I could probably figure it out if I looked at my calendar, but um, <laughs> I, awesome. I was in North Carolina. I was yeah. in North Carolina visiting my sister and your father had just done a podcast with uh, this site called Veritas. Oh yeah. And I remember that. I was, I just called your dad up. Just called him up on the phone. He was in the phone book. It was playing. He answered the phone like, hey, he had no idea who I was. I said, Can I come and visit? And he said, sure, come on over. And uh, and that was the same weekend that um, he met Chase Letsky also. So she oh, arrived at, wow. I didn't know she was going to be there. So, And I That's had already so cool. interviewed her on my podcast. So it was a, it was a dense little thing. So, yeah. Wow. I didn't realize y'all were there at the same time. I mean, as time goes on, you know, memories things like that you, you tend to forget, but, um, yeah. So I, I, I distinctly remember you being there and you, was your book, um, was your first book out? Nope. Not yet. No, it wasn't out to 2015. So the okay. second time I came there was with my partner at the time, Andrea. And then we were there for my sister's daughter's wedding. So it had been my niece's wedding, which was in Davidson, North Carolina. Okay, cool. So, and then, and, and then I, Andrea and I just drove over and and spent the. Well, we spent, we were there for a night. We spent the night there at the house. That's all. Yeah, no, I definitely remember. And you had camping gear, and you were. I just re my vivid memories of you from all those years ago was like very devoted, uh, camping nature man who's who's very <laughs> much into owls and synchronicities and and the paranormal. And I really want to pick your brain about owls because. I'm not sure if you've had the chance to read my dad's book, but there's at least three different occasions where he's had some very bizarre experiences with owls. And um, you're the owl man. I mean, you're you're the guy who the one guy I know who when you Google owls, you know, in the paranormal, it pops up. So um, I'd, I'd love to talk as much as you would enjoy. You you lay on me. You're not going to. So I, yes, I, within this funny little box of UFO researchers, I am well known as the owl guy. I did not pick that moniker. It picked me. <laughs> um, and then I'll also say that, uh, oh, yeah, I'm very, very familiar with your father's owl stories. In fact, uh, he, this is going back probably 2020, 2019. So just three years ago or so. I, uh, I interviewed. Oop, did we lose everyone? I'm back. Yeah, and there was I interviewed a, a your delay. father for that website. Oh, should I start over? Yeah, please. And for the listeners, apologize. We are having a little delay. We're trying to do our best with it. So if if you wouldn't mind running that back, sure. I didn't hear Where a word. was I? So I, I, uh, your father has had more owl experiences than there's a couple people out there. I'm one of them. And there's a few people out there, kind of on one hand, really, that have had a lot of owl experiences. Your dad is right there on the list. And I have to think that's filtered down into you and your siblings and family and such. But um, And I did a podcast where I interviewed your father only on his owl experiences. Oh, cool. Just, just, a, just his owl experiences. And there's like a bunch of them that are like, they're kind of like, they seem like they're kind of throwaway events. You know, like, hey, yeah. this owl showed up this. And it was like, there was one where he was like, uh, a neighbor had a had a tree. There was a windstorm and a tree kind of fell and kind of was pinned to the roof. And he climbed up on the roof with a chainsaw. And then when he got to the, like, the, the like he had to like put the ladder on the top of the roof and then climb up to the tree. And there was an owl that landed in the tree and everyone went, <gasps> <laughs> like all his buddies were there with the truck and chainsaws and ready to rip this tree apart. And, and, uh, and he went, climb down the ladder. Everyone felt the same thing. Like, don't you go up on that ladder? Mm. Everyone felt it. So wow. no one had to explain it to anyone. No one had to say, you know, the owl is kind of a symbol of something foreboding. So everyone just like knew it intuitively. Everyone went, oh, get off the ladder. 
And um, so he down climbed the ladder and then they did a whole thing where they tied the ladder up special ways and rigged it this way and that way. And, and when <clears throat> he did cut the tree, it like, I can't remember exactly the story, but you know, the, the, the tree was tilted on and he was, the ladder was there. And then when the tree, it like bucked and the ladder slipped off and your dad was tied on somehow. So, um, Oh, wow. Yeah. I really know that really, story. Yeah. Well, so yeah. So it's, it, it it's, totally right there dead center as far as the the lore of the owl right it doesn't have there's no flying saucers or ufos or anything like that connected with that event but there certainly was that ominous presence let's i say. feel like i feel like owls just like have that presence it's really wild but like when you see an owl especially when you see an owl in the wild it's like stunning like and i and it's it's unexplainable but it's i mean rare too it is it feels like <laughs> it feels unless rare, you're me. rare. Unless, you're me, yeah. <laughs> unless you're the <laughs> owl guy yeah for sure but i mean like you know i saw one just recently just within the past couple of weeks and it's probably been years since i've seen an owl and every time i see one it's almost like a shock it's like you know you can't even explain it i'd love to know what your thoughts are on that kind of that feeling Oh, they, every, it's universal, everyone. So so it, you could do it right now. Google UFOs, owls. And my name is going to be the first thing that comes up. And, and then about the next 25 things below that is going to be me. Um, you don't have to do it, but I mean. It, oh, yep, there you are. Yeah, it's no <laughs> Immediately. Joke. So, so if anyone, any, and that's been that way for over a decade. Wow. Like, like uh, before I was even, like, yeah, I was, so I was archiving and putting stuff on my website and writing about owls and UFOs starting around 2009. So, wow. wow. So, so what happened? I just got one like minutes ago. So I get, and your father must know what this feels like. Like, Oh, you're running website. So you must know a little bit what it feels like, but I'm getting like the people who are reaching out to me have had UFO and owl experiences. Mm -hmm. There's a little fluctuation where they might have had some other thing or some owl experience that was mystical, but not with the UFO or some UFO experience that was, didn't quite have an owl, but I'm, but anyone anywhere in the world, if they have never heard of me, if, if they had a UFO and owl experience co-joined, they're going to, they're, I'm like, two mouse clicks away and they get you're the guy they, <laughs> yeah. and i say right at the top of my website i say i want to hear your owl stories and they send them to me so so i oh, it's a tough to come up with a number but you know <laughs> many thousands yeah like and i Easily. only count the good ones like if there's a lot of people who say i saw this owl in a fence it was so pretty and i'm like that's all well and good but it's not going in my <laughs> files so <Yeah>. um, <laughs> but uh yeah. So, so well, your feeling. question was, your question was, what's the mythos of the owl? And yeah. so even the person who sees the owl on the fence says the same thing, like, oh, like it was an honor. Oh, it was so majestic. Oh, it had an ominous presence. All these things are, you know, these, they had a mystical feel to it. Then boy, when you see a bunny rabbit in the backyard, you don't get that feeling, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So an owl has got a majestic presence. And I would argue that one of the reasons it has that very strange presence is because owls don't have, um, like I can turn, I can turn my eyes and my, I can look, look right and left with my mm -hmm. eyes. Owls can't do that. Owls, owls, their eyes are locked in position and they have to turn their head right and left in order to, to look around. So they have a weird presence because they, they, they cannot turn their eyes. It's very, uh, once you understand that, then you realize like, Ooh, that is unsettling. But there's something just about their look, about how their eyes move or don't move in their head is very unnerving. Yeah, yeah. I always knew that they could like they could, you know, turn their heads all the way around. I thought I always thought that was just like a preference thing. I didn't know they actually couldn't move their eyes like the, that's and their, wild. their spine and their their. It's it's partial. It's I did. There's a chapter in the book on the on the physiology of the owl. So their spine allows for what's called um like head very good head stabilization. Like when an owl turns its head, you know some birds are kind of twitchy. Uh -huh. You know you see like the, a gyroscope. Like well, well like a gy well it doesn't it's not like quite like a gyroscope but it but sort of where it's eerily smooth. Uh huh. And um they actually have and they can turn their head all the way around facing back. They can't turn it. 360 right but they can turn it around and face completely backwards what it does 
is it pinches off the blood vessels to their to their brain and they have in so we have jugular veins they have jugular veins too right if we tried that we'd seize up our jugular veins wouldn't get any blood to our brain when an owl does that it has a special reservoir that stores up the fresh blood and then when they do straighten their head back out whoosh, their blood is flooded with fresh blood so they have no special way. Blood. yeah very strange and then what it's what so what we have where we get our stabilization is from our ear canal like our uh -huh. inner ear yeah, canal. Right. that's how we that's how we stay balanced yeah that's how we can ride a bicycle in the ears yeah, yeah. That's, how we, that's how we can stay balanced and ride a bicycle so the owls have that same thing and that's what they're they have that's what they use to keep that ear steady so an owl so an owl can fly at night in what would we would consider absolute complete darkness they can fly sure. through the forest between branches in a, on a starless night on the darkest night of the year they can do it comfortably no problem at all wow. because of their big eyes they have that much ability to see into the dark and then they, uh, and when they hunt, what they are doing, they are flying over, they are flying through the forest and their feathers are so highly attuned. Their feathers have, there's a ridge on one side that's kind of downy along one ridge and then uh -huh. it's sharp on the other. Don't ask me how it does it, but it baffles the noise in flight. So if you, it, I, this is another thing people say all the time, like an owl flew right over my head. I didn't hear it. Yeah. It. Like you can hear other birds. You can flap and pigeons and ravens and stuff like that. Oh like yeah. A ton of noise. But owls are what would be completely silent to our ears. And they fly at night and they listen for mice on the ground. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're mm -hmm. flying. They're listening they can target the noise of a mouse on the ground and then they lock their eyes on that spot. And then that's how they hunt in complete darkness. So yeah, it's they're amazing. They're a wildly specialized baffling. animal. Yeah. Really cool animals. Um, yeah. Anyway, go keep going. So you asked the question was why do they have a mystique? And then, Oh yeah, they certainly do. Yeah. Yeah. That, they are spectacular creatures for sure. So I'm very curious about like, the mythology of the owl, the spiritual mystique. It, so, so right. So every culture has a slightly nuanced, different mystique or, or let's say folklore or mythology about the owl. For instance, mm. um, so what I just said before, the owl can fly in the forest at night in complete darkness. And that like, go back to ancient man. Every, everyone would have understood that about an owl flying at night, flying in the darkness. It would have seemed magical to ancient man now we like a science you know biologists can say oh their eyes are specially tuned they have heightened hearing they, so, right but the mythology would be that the owl so so we live in a land of electric light bulbs right forest isn't scary anymore right we can just light up the forest right. we can go in the forest with flashlights we can you know but there was like not that long ago like my great grandfather's age there was no electric light bulb. The the night had a completely different mystique. Mm -hmm. mm. And and so the owls in flying into the night became a metaphor, became a they were magic. I mean, still yeah. like that 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 what they're doing now, obviously there's biology that allows them to fly at night, but wow, it's magic in many ways. So the owl would fly into the darkness. That became a metaphor for flying to the land of the dead flying Ooh. to the land of the ancestors, flying to the land, flying to that other realm, wow. that other place. And you take that one step further and it, they come back with a message, right? So when I was working on the first book, I had to pick a title for the first book. And what was happening is I was getting letters from people and it still happens. It just, but at the time I wasn't, I didn't do anything. It was just happening organically. People would send me letters and they would say, oh, this owl landed on the fence and my grandfather had just died and I had these paranormal events in my life. And when I looked at the fence, the messenger told me my grandfather was fine. So I'm paraphrasing roughly, mm. but people would call the owl the messenger. The messenger was at my window. You know, everyone messenger, was calling it that. Not everyone, but enough that it was recognizable wow. as, a, as a pattern. And so, so I, I just 
that's the, that's the ancient lore. That mm. is the ancient lore. The owl flies into the darkness, travels to another realm, whatever, you know, like that changes depending if you're Christian or Hindu or, sure. or if you're, a, you know, living in the plains of South Dakota in a, you know, but it comes back as a messenger now. That's the ancient mythology. So present day, the most popular series of books in the history of publication is Harry Potter. I was going to say it. <laughs> yeah. Harry, Potter, Harry Potter has an owl that delivers the mail, the messenger. It is perfect. It is perfect. Wow. I never this thought is, about this is, that. That's present day. Wow. That, right? That makes a lot of sense. And my, I, I wondered, so J.K. Rowling has oh. O-W-L in her name. But uh, so don't start wow. a new religion. Oh. On that, one. that, one's, that one's that one's more how my quirky brain works rather. Oh, than, I love that she has yeah, an owl in her patterns. Name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. And better. So so like the question is, I I would love to ask her. I, did she did that happen organically? Did it happen spontaneously? Did it just like oh I'll just like an uh, it felt like the right animal, so I'll put it in place for there. Or did was I she doubt a that? You think she was a student and of of mysticism enough it, that she would have yes i, I okay. do think so. we've done a whole episode on harry potter and like mm -hmm. I, I don't want to derail the owl conversation oh, but yeah, go ahead. you know aside from the fact that the surface level of harry potter is witches and wizards and <laughs> wands and spells when you dig beneath the surface of of you know the the fantasy aspect of it there's a lot of real world esotericism and occult packed into it some masonic symbolism templar myth stuff like that like i have no doubt in my mind that's intentional yeah you even look at the first book you know it's the philosopher's stone it's an extremely occult symbol it's mm -hmm. in in mystic lore and it's like you know i i mean every book is jam-packed full of deep occult stuff it it seems pretty apparent that she was at least like intrigued in, in, oh, in that yeah, kind of yeah. stuff you, oh, you know yeah, yeah. Uh, if not very, very well studied on it, because there's some deep stuff in Harry Potter. Yeah, like there's a textbook in the in the series written by a lifeless Levi, which mm -hmm. anybody out in you know out here in the real world, if you know who that is, that's that's a very uh, prolific name in the in the occult world. So she's yeah. she's definitely packing some secrets in there. Okay, good, good. Well, that's good to know because I'm my I was it's to me it would be more fun mm. if she didn't know and it just happened organically but that i certainly it that certainly happens sometimes where people will put an owl in fiction and it just happens um did you ever read slaughterhouse five the kurt mm -hmm. vonnegut book oh i i've read it no. that's a fantastic book i read it yeah. many so years a, ago but... yeah it's a it's like it was it's easy to find at garage sales it was it's like mm -hmm. came out i think in 1968 might be 69 and um this is the in that it's, story it's world war ii correct it's like it's, that's it's, a, the, it's that, the, right. the author kurt vonnegut is is dealing with his traumatic memories of being a mm. prisoner of war in world war ii he was yeah. in dresden and was locked in a in a meat locker they didn't have anywhere to put the prisoners they just locked him in a meat locker the americans came and bombed the city and when they made their way out of the meat locker, the city was gone, just flattened, <laughs> leveled. Everyone was dead. So it's yeah. a really nightmare story. But he he uses this this science fiction platform where the character that was Billy Pilgrim is the name of the character is like gets abducted by aliens, and because he's abducted by aliens, he has he's vaulting back and forth through time. So the story has this kind of jumping narrative where he's. Mm -hmm going jumping back and forth in time. But when he gets abducted by a flying saucer, there's a line I can, I'm going to riff and do this off the top of my head. Basically it says something like, um, I stepped into the yard because he's because he's like skipping through time. He knows what's going to happen. And I went into the backyard knowing full well, the flying saucer was going to arrive. There was an owl hooting mm -hmm. and mm. big flying saucer hovered over me and, and, took me to Trafalmador, which was the science fiction planet where he was taken. So, and the owl shows up a bunch of times symbolically each time the, the contact events take place. I don't, I, Kurt Vonnegut's gone. There's no one to ask, but um, I don't think that happened because he was a student of right this lore. I think that happened organically. He was just tapped in as the creative type. He was tapped into that, to that, mm -hmm to that creative like he was that that book is like if you if there was a list of top i might even be top 10 books of the 20th century but certainly in the top 50 everyone would include that book so that's not like a fly-by-night kind of insignificant 
piece of work. That's a major piece of popular culture literature. Hmm. And it has flying saucers and UFOs like totally interlocked. You know, oh, one you know what, one Mike? The other. You might like this reference. We recently, in the last like six to eight months, did an episode with a friend of ours named Tom Batforce, who runs like a, a pretty large DC Comics um, podcast where they talk mm -hmm. about just comic books, not even, you know, spiritual stuff. But he did a crossover with us because he wanted to start talking about spiritual stuff. And we did a whole episode about this series called The Invisibles. Mm. Sure. No, 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 sure. no, no, no. It's not The Invisibles, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Invisible is Grant Cameron. Invisible. No, not that one. Not no, that Grant, one. Grant, Grant, Grant. Um, oh, oh. The Department oh. of Truth. The Department of Truth. The Department of Truth. Yeah. And it has UFOs and owl symbolism. Mm -hmm. There were owls in that, right? Yeah. Did it have yeah, UFOs yeah. and owls? I'm going to write this down. What is it? It's, it's called, called the, the Department, Department of, of Truth. Truth. Yeah, we did talk about the Invisibles, but I got confused. Right. That's not the one I'm referencing. And I said it was Grant Cameron. It's not. It's Grant Morrison. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, I, right, know right, right. I know what you meant. I know what you meant. Yeah, and as far as the idea, a friend of your dad's, yeah, right. As far as the idea of like the divine inspiration sort of thing, like you 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 mentioned that you think uh, maybe the idea of using the owls and the UFOs in Slaughterhouse Five just kind of like happened organically. We we talk about that pretty often on the show as well, like those those like divine downloads, whatever you want to call them. Um, it's like that spark of inspiration. It's like whispers from the other realm. Well, it's kind of like a kind of like how you're describing the owls, like bringing a message from the other realm. You know, True. I, I almost I almost look at it like that. And we also relate it often to the Greek muses, you know, whispering inspiration into the ears of men. Um, so I think that does happen quite frequently. And it's even possible that, you know, that could have been the case with Harry Potter. Who knows? But I think it, it, it I mean, you see occult symbolism and and information in so many movies books video games music it's everywhere now and it's all that that divine inspiration those eerie downloads from that other realm well also we can talk about like um carl jung who just pretty much established in his work that like animal symbolism is universal in the subconscious mind mm. you know everybody no matter if you're aware of it or not everybody is uh, tapped into the symbolism of the animal kingdom on a subconscious level. So like that, that just, you know, I, I feel like that supports what you're saying, Mike. Yeah. Well, that's the, the term is that would be the archetype. That's a, that's, right. a, that's the vocabulary word that both Carl Jung used and Plato used was archetype. And uh, Carl Jung took it a little deeper than the, than Plato's, what it would be like 3000 year old definition. And, uh, that's kind of tied into the collective consciousness. So given Carl Jung's model, if there's a Jungian like scholar here, they might cringe a little bit as I try to riff on this, but let me do my <laughs> best. Um, he would, he would argue that, that uh, within our collective, like all of us universally, all of us have an inner knowing of what an mm -hmm. owl means. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's things that like are, are, inherent to all of us right so even as little kids where we have a fear of heights we have a fear of loud noises that that was genetically we can make sense of how that got f fed into our mm. to our psyche right but it's a little more as a little oh, like esoteric it's a it's a little more like why would owls why would a someone in kenya have the same mythology about owls as someone in siberia Right. So they're not exactly the same, but wow, they they follow the same lore. Uh, one, almost universally, owls are associated with death all over the world. Wow. Well, I mean, I'm sure you recall this, Mike, but back in 2013, when my grandfather died, um, we were riding in a limousine to my grandpa's funeral and we saw an owl on um, on. It was raining, too. So there should not have been an owl out. Whoa. It was a dark Oh, well, I mean, I say dark, but, you know, it was a cloudy, dark, rainy day in December, and there was an owl on a dead tree stump while we were riding to the funeral. So, Whoa. death. Okay. Another so, 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 so this is the question I ask. So what was your, what was your sense? I, I've talked to your father at length about this, but what was your sense? As I mean, in the moment, honestly, it, it might not be a surprising answer. It's just that, you know, we're on the way to honor the death of my grandfather. The owl was just comforting us or, mm. or, or, 
you know, just guiding us through the process. I mean, my grandpa's death was very sudden. He actually very shortly before he died, um, he had been healed of cancer mm. and he, he got the phone call pretty much like right in front of my dad. And it was kind of like a hallelujah moment and threw his hands up to the sky. And we saw orbs that he was healed of cancer. It was, Oh, and then there was another instance where an owl flew right down on the patio um, next door where my grandpa lived. You recall, mm -hmm. you've been to my old house. I, I, met my... Your, I met your grandfather at that weekend. I was there. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you were there just before he died then. Well, it would have been, so if he died in December, I was there in probably, it might've been. This was 2013 when he it died. It might've been. So. May. So it might have been okay. May. I think it was there in May. Yeah. Well, um, there an owl, you know, flew near them and and he kind of had this like miraculous healing of cancer. And he believed in that ever, you know, past that. I mean, initially when this UFO stuff broke with our family, they didn't believe any of it. They thought it was crazy. They thought it was drugs. They didn't want to accept it. And then he started having these experiences, seeing orbs, seeing owls, and then you know, and then he suddenly died. And we were all in, in huge shock. And I just feel like the owl was guiding us through it. You know, it was, it was, um, you know, I, I, I can't sit here and say why it showed up, but it was very ominous and very strange. I'm what you're sharing. I've heard hundreds of times, maybe thousands realistic. Well, but by not thousands, I've heard thousands of owl and UFO accounts, the, the owl and death accounts oh, okay. are almost universally there's some variation, but it is a parent passes and an owl shows up. So what's the conclusion? Passes. What does it mean? What it, so you just said it. You said it as plainly as you possibly could. You said it. What, okay. what did you feel? That it was significant. I just, I just felt like it was like, you know, it was all divinely orchestrated. I mean, nobody, nobody wants to sit there and say, wow, you know, fate or God took my grandpa away from me, but it was clearly mm -hmm. meant to happen. And, uh, and we were, you know, I, I had the sense that like, it, it was just fate. Like I, I just had to, you know. Okay. So, so here's, this is very common. So you were in a car with your whole family. The whole family was in the car. It was dad, a limo, mom. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, that's your, I talked to your dad and he, he said exactly the same thing. That's in, he says that's in that's in his book. That's I in my book too. That's in this book too. It's certainly that that story is in this book. Oh, cool. So, yeah. Here's a whole that I was actually gonna do I when this book got updated in two thousand I just added a little bit of extra stuff in two thousand twenty when this book got updated. And uh, there, so there's a couple extra paragraphs about your dad in there. And that was but that story was already in there. So let's go. Um here I'll tell a story that happened to me. Okay. Please. This would have also been, this would have been 2013, 2013. This would wow, have been how about that? In, in, but when my mom died. So my, wow. my dad died in 2012. My mom died in 2013, 13 mm. months later. So this would have been in the very end of July. My, this was, my mother was in an assisted living facility just outside of Davidson, and my sister lives in Davidson. So my sister was taking care of my mom and she has, she had Alzheimer's in the last few years of her life were brutal. Yeah, I'm sorry I had Just to deal brutal. with that. Oh, it was, it was, it was, it was so sad. So Alzheimer's oh. is tough. Yeah. So I was already well immersed in this owl stuff at that point. And, and I, my brother, sister and I were there. Oh yeah. So here, let me back up a little bit. You want to hear us, man. I'm going to back up a little bit. So yeah, I, I, I want to hear I was, all about, I was living, your this owls. Is, this is so. This is you were asking about owl symbolism. I was in living in Idaho at the time. I'm presently in Seattle area right now. But my little cabin in Idaho, I lived at high elevation. It was right near Jackson Hole. It was a beautiful spot near the Tetons and Yellowstone. And um, it gets hot during the day in the summer, and then it cools off. Like you need to. Nobody can have a convertible in where I lived there because it gets too cold at night, right? So you drive around the convertible. Hey, what a beautiful day! And then they're like freeze at night so <laughs> so uh so nobody has air conditioning so what happens is at night you just open the doors and there's not really any bugs to speak of at night once it gets cold so you just everyone just opens their doors totally wide open so i'm sitting here at my computer in the in in the kitchen the way the house was where my desk was i could look right into the kitchen and i'm typing away it's about 9 30 at night and i hear this like noise in the kitchen i think it's my cat and it's like, that doesn't sound right. And I look over and there is a ferret in my kitchen. 
like a big, a like wild a ferret, twenty what? inch long wild ferret, like a big what? weasel, in my kitchen. So I get up and I'm like, the, my what my fear was that this thing is going to come deep, deeper to the house and like get under the couch and I won't be able to get it out. My cat's <laughs> in there and stuff like that. So so I walk up to this thing. This is like white linoleum floor. All the kitchen lights are on, like fully lit. Like this is not like I get a fleeting glimpse of this thing. And I stand right over this thing and I say, I kind of go with, I kind of like, kind of, you know, got to go. <laughs> and, and I said, you can't be here. You need to leave. You need to go. You can't be here. And it hops out onto the porch. And that's when we have a real stare down, like full on, like two minutes of just, well, probably a minute of just like, <laughs> and now ferrets remember the mink family, their fur is just lush, like yeah. shiny and beautiful. And they've got these big, adorable eyes and the big wet nose. And just they <laughs> have this life and vitality when they move around. And They're I stared adorable. at this thing and then it just walked off into the bushes. Wow. So I immediately looked up what kind of ferret it was. And there's a ferret called the black footed ferret identical. Like I was like, I was, I'm sick. I was, it was at my feet. Yeah. Couldn't have been any closer. I'd have to, the only way to get closer, I'd have to be on my knees. Uh -huh. Right. So, and so I totally, the ID did it hundred percent black footed ferret. Black footed ferret was considered extinct until the 1980s. And there's only a few places where they're known to live in. One of them is in, in Colorado. And then right in the Colorado Wyoming border, how this thing got in my, kitchen in idaho what like. so yeah that's bizarre I go, I go to bed that night i put a i put a facebook picture on i put a picture of the black-footed ferret that i found online i put it on facebook i get up really early the next morning which is unusual for me at that point in my life I get up at like six and my brother leaves a message for me my brother's on the east coast i'm in the mountain time so there's a few hours difference and he says mike call me so i called him up he says mom had an aneurysm last night Get a get a get on a plane now. Whoa. So I get on a plane. Mm -hmm. And then I so now just let me let me back in. So my mom was unconscious. She never regained consciousness. Mm. I this is a part that I don't tell very often, but I was like my brother, sister, and I took turns always being in the room with her. Mm. So there was always someone in the room with her. And there was a point there was kind of, you know, you sit there and mom's totally unconscious. And I took my shoes off. This is a weird thing, but I took my shoes off and the way the bed was and the way the chair was, I, it was, I put my feet under the blanket and touched my mom's feet. It felt mm. great. It felt great. It felt it was really touching thing to do. So I, and then I was typing up and I was writing up this story, just exactly the story I told about the ferret. And I said, um, I typed, did, could that, does this, connected to my mom in some way in the ferret and my mom groaned audibly it was the only noise she made in three days no. when i typed when i typed does this have anything to do with my mom the ferret so what i said my mom like completely sad tragic last year of her life was awful mm. this shining glorious animal stands in my kitchen and i say you can't be here you need to leave and that mm. and, and that was the night she had the aneurysm so it was an omen i was like say, what's an omen it's like is it an omen is it a premonition is it a divine <laughs> is it a divine <laughs> message is it is it me connecting to the spirit of my mother you can look at this a hundred ways i don't wow. know what the answer is yeah yeah so so i a couple three days later i'm my i'm on with my mom, I'm sitting on one side of the bed. My sister is sitting on the other side of the bed. And my brother was out of the, he was at the hotel at the time, and which was right nearby. And, but we caught, but my mom passed. I was holding her hand and my sister was holding her other hand. It was a really touching, beautiful life experience that I, I'm not the only person who's had that experience, sure. but it was real. it felt really important. Wow. So mom passes. It's like, it happens at like, three in the morning and oh my gosh there's a ten thousand things to do and phone calls and planning and people to contact and and my brother sister and i took turns and then we we're like trying to sleep and so finally that that next day kind of comes to an end and we're on the back porch where my sister lives and her neighbor from across the street ruthie is there 
So Ruthie's sitting, there's like this kind of, you can imagine like a pretty backyard in the North Carolina with the big trees and, and a big yeah. deck. And so we're on this kind of big couch, kind of wicker couch thing. And, and Ruthie's directly across from me, my sister. So I'm in the middle. My older brother, Jim is on one side. My sister Jeannie is on the other side. And, and Jim and Jean, like every morning I would get up and I'd say, Jim, Jean, look, I got more owl stories. They just arrive in my email inbox. And they're like, well, Mike, what are you talking about? Why well, I'm doing this research about <laughs> owls and it's all really weird. And it's like, and I would read these letters and it's totally like, yeah, I saw a UFO. And then this owl flew over and then, the, you know, then I had like, you know, I was had ESP or whatever it might be. And they're just like my, mm. you could tell they were like, what are you, Mike, what are you into? And <laughs> so I'm sitting in the middle of them. And then Ruthie's sitting across from us and she says, she's like, told my sister's best friend she's like mm. you know, like she's a, she's this really lovely heart-centered like angel of a person so mm. she says jim gene mike i know there is an afterlife and i know because of an experience i had with an owl and and my sister does the thing where she kind of goes no 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 like I don't want to hear it I don't want to hear it <laughs> my brother like looks at me like what the like did you <laughs> did you plan this did you put her up to this did you pay her did he give me this look like like what is going on and I'm like my and Ruthie like sees it and like just before Ruthie's face like what did I say <laughs> I'm like I'm like okay Ruthie just just so you know you don't know this but I've been doing this research about owls I want to hear your story mm. wow so she says oh, my, my, when my daddy died. She's the same age as my sister, older sister. This would have been 10 years ago. She would have been in her late 50s. She's, she's, I, when my daddy died, I was grieving. I was grieving. It was so hard for me. And every day, as part of my grieving process, I would walk this path. And the neighborhood has this little kind of nature trail that goes around the, through the trees and she would she would walk that every day and then she came every day she would pass an owl on a branch and then finally she said the owls shouldn't be out the owl hooted and she stopped and she said the owls shouldn't be this shouldn't be here every day owls shouldn't be out during the day and she looked at this owl and she said are you my daddy and she she just said her grieving ended whoa and the owl flew off and she wow. says because whoa. of that experience i know my daddy she said it she said um, the messenger there was a message delivered like my, the owl flew off she never saw the owl again she was she was grieving the grieving stopped wow that story i have heard i don't know how many times a lot and it's and so that, and I'm, I would argue that, oh, so there's, I, I just held the floor here for a long time, but there's a lot going oh, on no, in that no. story with owls, archetypal animals, right? So a ferret, which has got, which is a symbolic of life. It's very feminine. It's a symbolic of life and dy dynamism and the owl, which is symbolic of, it's less a symbol of death and more a symbol of that, of that transference or that transformation from life to death so yeah yeah no i don't i don't get the bad sense of owls like a you know a warning of death it seems more like it's they they appear around death right mm -hmm. like when you know to sort of guide through the process it, am i just making this up here nope no i mean that's there's a every story is a little different right so, i got one for you to, go, to, to go, go. help that claim and and i'm sure if you've read my dad's book then you know the story but I, i'm i'm sure not every listener out there has read my dad's book. Mm -hmm. So in chapter two or three, um, he writes a chapter basically about how he had a pretty crazy owl experience at the church when he was 10 years old. As a little boy, he he would always, um, you know, back then living out in the country's area of Grace Creek, it was like not many street lights, dirt roads, very dark, um, very secluded country area and he would always get dropped off at like church and he would be there till night and he would have to wait at the church until you know my grandma drove up in the car and pick him up and anyway so one night he's waiting there and an owl just flies up and basically gets right in his face and then it was within a few days that he was shot by a shotgun and basically died and was completely changed for the rest of his life and it's like you know 
the owl appeared, but he didn't die. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, he did. They, he did. He did. I was, so this is, I don't want to speak for your father, but it, like given his ex- explanation, he did have the transformational process. Right. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he basically died, but he, yeah. he, he lived, you know, it's like yeah. people, people died dying. Come back, came back. But, yeah. 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 And he always described. I, I've, I've I've been to that tree. He I, he drove me there. We got out of the car. He stood there. He pointed right to the tree. He pointed right to the branch where the owl was. This old big like like big fat oak tree, I guess, like that was in the parking lot of the church. Yeah. So I've stood right in that exact spot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then he was um, shot in a hunting accident. It's actually, when I think about it, it was doves. They were hunting doves. Right. And um, another it was a total another accident. another symbol uh, um, archetypal. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Repeat. That's why I said, now that I think about it, wow. you know, it's a bird, it was a dove. And um, it was just an accident. You know, he was 10, his cousin was nine or 10 and his best friend out there with him was nine or 10. And like dad bent down to pick up a shotgun shell or something like that. And then when he stood up, um, you know, a bunch of nine year olds shouldn't be handling shotguns and he, just, <laughs> he got shot in the back, Um, you know, and he, he almost died. I mean, he, he yeah. always described to me my whole life and everybody who ever asks that it was like immediately he left his body on what he felt like was, you know, how the silver surfer flies around on a surfboard. He felt mm-hmm. like it was like that, like kind of like on a surfboard, just shooting through the stars. It's these stars. Um, yeah. I'm interested to know um, if you don't mind when, when was the first time that you kind of put the whole owl and UFO thing together? How did that, how did that come about for the first time? Uh, 2006, I was living in the little town in Idaho, which, so I was working as an outdoor educator teaching mountaineering in Alaska. So I would spend the summers in Alaska teaching mountaineering. And then I, in the winters I would teach winter skiing. And then there was some shoulder season stuff I would do with climbing and camping and stuff like that. So, but I was, um, where I lived in the little town of Driggs, Idaho, there was a branch for the school I worked for. There was a branch there. And all my friends worked for the school. So you just, it was, I could ride my bike there. It was this beautiful idyllic life that I lived there for those years. And so, I, and there was this young woman there and she had been working all summer. This would have been the end of September, early October. I can't pin the date down exactly. End of September, early October of 2006. I would have been 44 years old. I'm 60 now. And she and I got in a conversation. She knew my books, my cartoon books where I did cartoon instructional books for um, for camping and such. So I said, oh, Ma, you've been here all summer. You've been all summer in the Tetons and the Yellowstone. You must have been camping all the time. And she said, oh, I never camped once. I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> terrible. That's terrible. I'll take you camping. So this total stranger, I'll take you camping for one night. Let's go. And so we went out. And this was kind of a first date. That might sound kind of funny to a lot of people, but in 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 that part of the world, like camping is like a normal total thing to that's oh, like yeah. going on a hike and going skiing. Going oh, camping. I don't it's think it's super, weird at all. Yeah. So I just took this woman camping for a first date. So, so, and that's I didn't awesome. really know her. Her name is Kristen and we're still good friends. Oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah. And, and so she, uh, so we went and we got to the spot in the mountains and this is like, where is the sun is setting? I just walked in with really light packs. We went without a tent. It was going to be a beautiful wow. night. I could read the weather. It was going to be only one night. Get this weather in the autumn. It just magical, perfect, cloudless sky. And you know, it's good. So no, we didn't take a tent. So we're, we're sitting on this big flat rock and this field of wildflowers and the stars are coming out. And she's, she, this to know to tell the story correctly. There's a, there's some details. This She's telling me the story. And I'm like, whoa, wow. This is someone smart. This is someone with some depth. This is someone with like, this is, I did not expect this, this of this stranger. Like, wow, we had a really deep conversation. And as that happened, this owl flew right over our heads. Wow. And then a neck, two owls, then another owl, then a third owl. And for the next two hours, these owls just flew around us. So we were in bear country. So where we were cooking, we had to put everything away. And then we walked for, we didn't walk very far, like a little bit. So we had to walk away and the owls followed us. And then we found a spot to sleep and we set our sleeping pads out on the ground. And so we're like lying on the ground. And what would happen is these owls would, like we're in our sleeping bags, looking up at the stars, total complete inky black night with a trillion stars, far North Rocky mountains. 
high elevation and these owls would like totally silent fly in front of our faces and for just a half a second whoosh, whoosh, they would be inky black like the blotted wow. out the sky so the next day we were oh so so the next day we were like on fire wow the owl thing that was so cool so i said hey <laughs> if you ever want to go camping again let's go she said great so four days later we went camping one more time went to a totally different part of the mountains and then I, it was kind of cold that night so i said let's hike up to the, that hilltop and we'll warm up so we'll hike up to this hilltop we were way above what would be called tree line so it's big open tundra you know where there's no trees at a certain elevation so we we hike up to this lone peak and watch the sunset and as the sun is setting an owl flies over us and then a second owl and then a third owl three owls before they kind of stayed over there they'd kind of land on a branch way out there but this time like they were they were right up close they were like landing on the branch right next to us on a little bush they landed at our feet i can so clearly see the look on Kristen's face of just like just astonishment and this is a completely different area right completely different area and this Whoa. is a weird thing to say it's a weird thing to say but i'm i'm gonna say that they were the same three owls don't i mean i can't prove that but that's certainly my sense yeah i mean your intuition we're in it now yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> wow no, that's that's an incredible story so hold it wait so 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 <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it was there yet, Ryan. Was, what it's was the relationship to UFOs? Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh -huh. so I so when I so I did not say this at the time, but I'm saying it now. As I was having the real experience of looking at real owls, I had a voice in my head that said, a voice in my head could have been my own it's very murky, you know, like a voice uh -huh. in your head. What does that mean? The voice said, This has something to do with the UFOs. So I'm looking at an owl. Your voice in my head says, this has something to do with the UFOs. Whoa. And I'm, so this so, is how so, it all started. Well, in my youth, I had like missing time events and I saw gray aliens in my yard and I saw UFOs and stuff. So, Ooh. but that had been a long time before. And I had just oh been, I could gosh, talk I about it. I want to hear about that now. <laughs> and, well, that's, yeah, so, I, so, so, so here, so, so like to have it happen once, was pretty cool right. right like wow that's awesome to have it happen twice with the same person and what might be the same owls and mm -hmm. four days later i was like just like i lost my mind like i totally yeah. lost my mind i was like ah what does this mean and i <laughs> like and i and what i and so this was at the point in my life when i was like i knew i had to look into the ufo stuff in my life mm -hmm. like i knew i had to deal with this in my life mm -hmm. like i knew i couldn't push this away and then like it was like there was always this kind of like there's gonna be a day I'll get around to it and I'm right. but I'm not gonna do it now no way uh uh not yet not now but that just ooh, that just like pushed me right so I started reaching out to UFO researchers and I reached out to Bud Hopkins do you remember there's a character named Leo Sprinkle have you come across his name in the literature I've I've heard his name I know my yeah dad's he's, he died he died just. A year that's met him or he's told me about him or something yeah your dad may have met him i bet you so but he died about a year ago he was like 95 or something like that but he was really sharp right up to the end and really great but anyway so so he was in wyoming so i could i met with him and and he said he did this thing he was like mike here's here's a call this guy give you here's this number call this person so every person i talked to i would ask you know i'd ask like you know what's your ufo story and then but i would also always ask like if you ever had any odd experiences with owls <laughs> you try it ask someone who's had ufo experiences ask them have you ever had any out experiences with owls Ooh, get ready i'm gonna do that get ready oh yeah get ready it's not gonna be 100 percent, but i'll tell you sure get ready you're gonna hear the weirdest can i swear Whoa. absolutely <laughs> yeah, you're, gonna, you're gonna hear the weirdest shit imaginable so <laughs> so <laughs> so let's so i started a blog in 2009 Kristen, okay. the girl the young woman i was went to sure. camping she moved out of the valley hmm. and so but we kept in touch i had her phone number and stuff so when i <clears throat> the story i just told about the owls and flying around and the, that without without the detail of the voice in my head i, I talk about that now i'm kind of over all that at this point trying hmm. to, i don't try to hide anything at this point so <laughs> so um i got a hold of her and because i did a blog post huh. and i put out the blog post up and that would have been in march of 2009 so three years later, and I contacted her and I said, Kristen, what were we talking about? I remember we were talking about something the very first night 
we saw the very first owls. What were we talking about? And she said, oh, I remember exactly what we were talking about. I was giving my deepest, most heartfelt definition of what God means to me when the first owl showed up. Wow. Now, what did she say? She just basically told, she basically, well, this is, for, that would be more for her to answer. This has been this is like 17 <laughs> years ago, 18 years ago now. So I just have but, to know what she said. So, yeah. So basically she gave a very thoughtful definition of like, of how God is, I'll pit riff. I should be able to do this pretty close. So, so that she's not at all churchy as, and neither am I, but That's I certainly, rec certainly recognize the, the spiritual en enormity of that. Oh, sure. And though I'm certainly like, I believe in a, in what we would call God. Oftentimes I don't say that I'll say the universe or the ever present all or something like that. Or, and, and, uh, so she was just, yeah, she gave a very beautiful, anyway, she, she would answer that better than I could. But what mm -hmm. that did, so this is three years later, I'm, I've got a website that I'm writing about UFOs and owls on. Actually, I, it was only the first few days of the website of the blog. And this happened. And I was wow. Like, wow. Like for me, I'm already like that thing where I said I went insane, like that feeling of being insane. <laughs> I say this, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm maybe exaggerating a little bit, but I'm not much between 2006 and 2013. I felt, I feel like I spent 95% of my waking hours wondering if I had gone insane because Whoa. after That's that event, it wasn't like I was hit with not so much UFO experiences and not so much owl experiences. I had a little of that, but, but I was hit with so many synchronicities at a, at a mm. level that was blew my mind. <laughs> and so I was, I was just basically things were happening to me with such a overwhelming intensity in a way that like the world, my parents, the schools, the New York times, well, New York times changed a little bit in the last few years, but like the, the, General consensus said this cannot happen. What you mm. what you're describing in your life cannot happen, but it was happening. And I was I was so off balance. And it was in those years that I was writing furiously on my blog about my what would be a lot of it was about synchronicities and a lot of it was about what is about owls and a lot of it was about UFO contact memories or events that were taking place during that time. Okay. Sorry, I'll do the thing. This is I should have the coffee is. Oh no, no, this no, is no. fantastic. Turned into a you're, little chatterbox. You're very, so. you're very thoughtful, so, yeah. intentional storyteller. I'm, it's amazing. Yeah, I'm enthralled. Um, yeah, no, I, I know exactly the feeling you're describing, Mike, and you're definitely not insane. I, I've had many experiences. You, uh, you do know, yeah, and your father certainly knows. And that was I the actually first know half the book of half. Yeah, you, you know, yeah. And, and so it's does unfortunate. anyone else. So does anyone else? For sure, for sure. Lots of people know that feeling when you have some sort of paranormal experience, and it's like everyone around you is telling you it's not happening and you're like, this shouldn't be happening. And it can make you feel very ungrounded. I, I, you know, it's like not, not that you're going insane, but it certainly feels that way when you have no, there's, well, there's low no... key. It's low key gaslighting when people do that to you because they're trying to make you believe in a reality that is not your reality. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, they're, they're trying to tell you what your reality is. And, but they, I think they, they believe can't it. Do... Many of them. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. It's, but but it's it's both at the same time. It's it's like, you know, the the thing that's so bad about gaslighting is you make people feel like they're insane. They're they're living in a world that's not real or not lining up to with what you believe or with what the other person believes. It, that's exactly what that does to somebody is it makes them feel like, well, what's wrong with me then? Yeah. Yeah, you, sorry you know, I had to go through that all by yeah, yourself, Mike. That's awful. Oh no, but well, it was you know honestly it wasn't all by myself. Strangely enough, the blog. What a weird. Mm. So this is like this was 2009. If you turn the clock back, that was really early on in like what would be called the blogosphere. That was so I was mm. I wasn't yeah. on the ground really floor, before podcasts. Was, oh yeah. Well, I, I started a podcast in 2009, so I was. I was well, you were awful. ahead of the curve, man, because it was well, not, not much ahead of the curve. I wasn't there. It was, was not a big common thing for everybody yeah. to just have a podcast. Oh yeah, yeah. So, but um, but so I wasn't alone in that sense, because I was meeting Good. people through the, through the blog. And, oh, that's amazing. Uh, you know, you, I just listened to a podcast you did with your, might've been the last one that was on and you were talking with your sister yeah. and, and yeah, you said so. something, you said something like, like you, you go to a party 
and people are just talking about this like boring stuff like you know this day-to-day stuff like you know he said she said or like you know this new thing i got or this new tv or something and it just it just it's just like it's i i and i i could tap into it totally i can't remember exactly what you said but but there's just this like what a why are you wasting time on this <laughs> when there's like you know all who are we what are we yeah. here for what does it all mean you know like those are like why aren't we why aren't you going there yeah. you know, I, I there was like, a time in my younger <laughs> years i say that i mean i'm only 29 but like even younger when this was stuff you know a lot mm-hmm. more new than it is now there was a time where it was all i ever ever wanted to talk about was the ufo stuff or the paranormal or whatever and I, I, I had to learn the very hard way that most people don't want to hear it. And if they do, they'll let you know. And it's okay if they don't, because now I have a podcast that I could just go broadcast it and get that out of my system. You know? Yeah. So it's really helped me a lot. I'm sure like your blog helped you. This podcast has helped me in, in ways that people just couldn't even imagine. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. In fact, so the, I did a podcast my initial podcast was called hidden experience it's all still archived on you can get it anywhere find it anywhere but i was that was like therapy 100 percent therapy <laughs> it was like oh yeah five years of therapy like who do i talk to i want right. to talk to richard dolan like how um, do i even well, I, I just i'll ask him to be in my podcast like that was my that was my methodology just so so it's it's like I was, you can hear it. I mean, it wasn't hidden and I was needy and I wanted the, I wanted help. So <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. You've come a long way, Mike. It, it's been incredible. I mean, is, is there anything before we go? Is there anything that you feel like you haven't gotten off your chest? <clears throat> but like, oh, I, so the problem is, okay. <laughs> like I got like off, like I've gotten it all off my chest. I mean, if you, if you stack my books up, it's was they're Like, it's like over, a, it's like 1500 pages of, Okay, or I got it. Go ahead. I got a question for you. Why do you actually think that owls appear with paranormal sightings, synchronicities, UFOs? What's the meaning behind it? Why specifically do they appear? Okay, so do you know Richard Dolan at all? Or he published I have, my books I, initially. My dad's been on his show, and I've met him once on the phone, but I don't know him that right. well. So he, my, so so I knew him pretty well because he 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 published my books initially. And nice guy. He's a super great guy, super great guy. And so, so when I did the first book, this book, the blue book, um, he was, he was, uh, he called me up like, Mike, Mike, I'm loving your book. Your book is great. I really, yeah, I'm really like, but well, like, when do you get to the point when you say like, what does the owls mean? What, like, when am I going to get there? And I was like, oh, you're going to be really disappointed at the end of the book. So, so I kind of, and he, and then I did a second book here. I'm, I got my books here on the desk here, but the second book was stories from the messengers, which is, oh, cool. Uh, which is a, all the stories that wouldn't fit into the first book. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so here you must understand. So you know what it means to like, like there's a thing and an event and then you try to tell it, but it's like, but I got to, in order to really understand it, you got to tell this thread over here, but we can't really <laughs> understand that thread until you tell this thread over here. And then, and then this tapestry emerges and then there's like no beginning, middle and end of the story because it's just like, so many events are knotted together. That's what I was finding in people's reports, as well as in my own life experience. That that's how it was playing out. Uh, so that book was sort of this book was sort of examining that tight tapestry with about there's about sixteen stories. But in the, here, I'll even do it. I'll open this book up because this is uh, in, in the. So when I did the second book, he published the second book, and he's rich is from new york city he's pretty tough and he was like mike no, no way you're not getting away with it this time no way i'm not letting you you're, you got it you can't do it you got to tell you got to give your reasons of what it means and so i'm just going to read it because it's short okay excellent <laughs> oh nice that's okay, perfect so this is so um again why owls on a purely intellectual level i don't know but my gut feeling gives me a glimpse into some possible answers mm. here are four ideas on what owls might mean each of which are followed with another question. So I kind of cheat. Like I could say, oh, here's what it might mean. And then I say, well, but who knows? So number one, owls are alarm clocks. The simplest answer is that they are here to wake us up. But Ooh. to wake us up to what? Number two, owls are an archetype. They are a symbol, an image stored deep within humanity's genetic memory bank. It's as if there are hidden meanings locked away within our grand shared consciousness, and the owl is a key. 
we think in symbols and the owl is touching us on that level. And wow. this deeper knowing goes back to the dawn of man. But what is the hidden archetypal meaning? Whoa. Number three, owls are here to announce initiation. So, so like part of my research is I've talked to a lot of shamans, people who do shamanic mm. work, and it is well understood within shamanic communities that owls show up. It's like owls show up at the time of the initiation of a shaman. They just show up. Wow. So given, so let's go, let's, so your dad, I'm going to, I'm going to just, shaman is a tough thing to, to define, right? So one person would have a, one definition, one person would have another. Now your father is doing healing work. He's doing, has psychic abilities. I mean, this, that would healing work in a community that would be a shaman. So mm. what in the owls showed up during what would be his initiation. Mm. I think yeah. that's fair Whoa. to say that so this is, this is absolutely common. It's, yeah. it's not just your dad. I definitely consider my dad like a shaman. Oh, mm. oh yeah. Like, like more or less, you know, shaman, you get shaman like a, a shaman, a wizard, yeah, all of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So, okay. Owls are here to announce initiation. An initiation is a ritual, like a young Catholic receiving the Eucharist for the First Holy Communion. Owls often seem to show up just before the arrival of a UFO, as if to announce an important impending ritual. Religious scholars would argue that this initiation, that these initiation rites are metaphoric of a profound change within the initiate. But the true believer wouldn't see the initiation as a metaphor. The change would be entirely real. But an initiation into what? Number four, the owls are a totem of the transformational experience. Seeing a UFO can transform someone. I've spoken to a lot of people who have seen strange craft in the sky, and in that moment, their entire definition of reality is altered. I've also poked, excuse me, I've also spoken to people who have had owl sightings at such highly charged moments that it transformed their lives. But a transformation into what? Wow. So, so you asked. That was that's the best I could come up with as far as my no, answer. That, that was that that was in, incredibly deep. And I do yeah. want to say something. I just realized earlier you asked me, what did I feel in the moment when I saw the owl going to the funeral? Well, I wanted to preface, or, or not preface, but you know, speak in hindsight. It's twenty twenty, right? Profis. Um, <laughs> profis. <laughs> not a word. I, I didn't really feel anything in the moment. What I feel like is, what if the owl or you know X Y Z other symbolic thing in nature is there, so that afterwards the meaning can also be gleaned? Because in the moment, I'm, it's just grief. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you're, you're not. You're not thinking. Oh, look! It's an owl from the spirit. I mean, most people are not thinking. It's an owl from the spirit world. Right. It's here right now. You know. I, I promise you, I wasn't thinking that in the moment. Mm -hmm. Ruthie did. But in, I'm sure. You know. I'm sure people do. But I'm just wondering if what if the symbol, you know, the animals, whatever symbolism is present in the experience, so that it can be contemplated past, present, or future, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? So it could be the experience could be like contextualized. Right. Yeah. And understood as yeah. a spiritual experience. It's kind of like a reminder, like, like, you know, hey, it locks don't forget. in. I think symbolism like locks in the significance of, uh -huh. of the metaphorical metaphysical stuff. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Oh, okay, my yeah, own yeah, yeah. So so we we. OK, so I had a hypnosis session. Cool. In 2018. Oh my God. Some, oh my God. The stories. I like, uh, I'm happy to tell it. It takes a long time. Yeah. To go for it. Please. Well, let me, so let me, so, so do you know, do you know Yvonne Smith? My dad does. Okay. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me. Your dad does. So, so I, I was, I, I was going to be in California. Her offices are in Pasadena. So I was going to be in California and I said, Hey, I'm going to be in California in this 2000 summer of 2018. So I visited her. And so I, we said, we're going to explore one night in my life where this sure sounds like a UFO contact event. I won't go into that right now, but, but mm. wow, does it's like textbook. Well, in the main, not textbook. It's like, you got to be pretty well immersed in the mm. lore, but wow. Was, but there was no fear associated with that night. 
So right. I was like, okay, let's explore that. And then I said at the beginning, I said, hey, by the way, let's, while we're talking, some point in this, we're talking, when I'm under hypnosis, you ask me, like, what's up with the owls? Can you do that? Mm -hmm. She's like, of course I can do that. I can do it. So we go through this whole thing and I freaking swear at the stars and I'm like so worked up and I'm screaming and yelling and crying and like just so worked up. And then <laughs> like it kind of comes and I kind of, oh, we kind of, she gets me back to where I'm like, things are. <laughs> and then, and then at the very end, she goes, and Mike, what is your connection with owls? And I didn't skip a beat. Right. So have you ever heard hypnosis trans trans have you ever listened to it? Like the hypnosis? I've, I've had it. I've done it. Oh, really? Yeah. Have you listened? It's like it's like someone asks a question. There's like a pause. You're definitely altered. And then, yeah. And then you're just like this whisper. And you kind of stammer. Or I do. I kind of uh, well, uh, I, I don't know what's happening. Like that kind of thing happens. So so she says, and Mike, what is your connection to owls? And I say, the owls aren't important. I don't whisper it. I don't kind of I'm not stuttering. This is, I like for the last 12 years, I'd been getting up every morning and owls, owls, owls. That's all I do all day long. And I got books on owls and like, like podcasts on owls. And I talked to, I went to UFO conferences, stood at like, on, I like, that's all I talked about. Owls are the most important thing. <laughs> that wasn't you talking. <laughs> so I said, and then I said, I said, I am an artist and I know the meaning of a symbol. Wow. Ooh, this is like this is coming out of me. So I've I can do this totally riff. I, this is like this is like seared into my psyche. Whoa. And I said, the owls aren't important. The owls are a symbol on a door. It is the door that is important. We Damn. are on it is the correct symbol for the door, but the owl isn't important. We are on this side of the door in a tight, claustrophobic little hallway. And on the other side of the door is an infinite vastness. Wow. And then I, and, then I and I would like, I didn't know where that came from. And that, <laughs> yeah. and she, I actually said, do you think I was channeling? She said, yeah. Well, she had Definitely. a good answer. She, she said, how do I know? Which is a good I mean, answer. <laughs> I don't want to like interpret your experience or whatever, but my first take is like the doorway is initiation. It's yeah. It's oh, awakening. Yeah. You That's know? what I get from it. I too. was thinking that earlier when you said the owl showed up when you and um your friend, um, Kristen. not Ruthie, Kristen. yeah, when you were camping and you saw the owls, Kristen C H R I S T, first five letters are Christ, same as Christ. Wow. Yeah, there you go. Wow. There you wow. go. I didn't even catch that. I, this it, is all, I'm like weird like that. So, yeah, no, that's not weird. That's <laughs> oh, yeah, no. noticing the, the patterns. Yeah. Because yeah. here's the thing reality is it's it's from the mind it's there there's one original mind you know if we want to talk about concepts of god god is the original mind from which everything is a thought form emanating from that mind you know and like the the closer you get to to interfacing with that mind or understanding it and how it works and operates you start to have these crazy synchronicities in the world around you like that and like with numbers and like with <laughs> letters and symbols and animals and nature and ufos and it's it's all just it's it's all weird you know my dad says this he says you know everything's magic <laughs> literally everything's magic but yeah yeah you were definitely awakened that's the sense that i got and um yeah. wow incredible story um if you had one thing i know i said that was the last question but if you had one <laughs> thing if everybody in the world was listening right now um what's the one thing that you feel like you would need to tell the world mm -hmm. so a guy came up to me at a ufo conference and i was this was early on i was going to ufo conferences and i was just i did it just to be around people that i could talk with and he said so what brings you here and I'm like oh i've had these experiences and all this and i'm so well how's your life different now they've had these experiences i had to think for a little bit i said i now live in a magical universe <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was I true. That. And that's I like what I that. would say. I would say like, wow, you want, you know, you get whatever you're just, you got to get your car fixed and you got to get on enough money in the checking account. And there's like these <laughs> normal day to day things that are hard. They're real. Yeah. They're hard. Yeah. But beneath it all parallel to it all, we, we live in a magical universe. And, and if you are open to it, it it's happening all the time, all mm -hmm. around. That's wow, a that's beautiful deep. message. I love that. It's deep. 
Mike, where can everybody find you? Your books, your website, wherever you want to direct people to go to find you. And please mention that. Um, you can just Google UFOs and owls and I'll come right up. And if, if yeah, I, I tried it, need, he's not lying. It's real. Yeah, I tried you it. To, you don't need to know how to spell my last name, which is C L E L L A N D. You can go to mikecleland.com. And from oh, there, yeah. you can get to the books and the podcast and the blog. And the, so, so, um, yeah, so that would be the best place to start. Oh, wait, I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to push this thing, which I, I, I'm, I'm from Michigan. So I'm, oh, do I have it here? I don't. Can I, I'm just going to get up for one second. Yeah, that's you, fine. You take your time. Wow, dude! <laughs> I put my earbuds so back cool. in. Um, I I'm I, reading. I'm reading those books. I can't wait. I to just get your this is. Book. I just got this book is uh, called The Unseen. It is a fiction book, and oh. I, 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 like I, I lost. I like I gave. So I've been working as an illustrator for most of my life, and I kind of artist, illustrator, creative type. Wow, I've never done a deep dive like this so <laughs> i i try i wrote a book when and you must know what i mean here like like people will tell me one owl story and then the next day i'll hear another owl story it's like not quite the same thing mm -hmm. right someone will have the detail with this and then another will have other details and and one person will say am i alone in this and i'm like oh no no i have heard that i have not heard that exact story but i have heard so many with the same flavor and mood i can't i mm. cannot tell you how many times i've typed flavor and mood in an email to someone I said mm -hmm. you're not alone so this i tried to imbue this book as much as i possibly could with that elusive flavor and mood so i wow. love that and you just put it out like last week in the week or the week before correct a like, little less than a month ago it came out yeah so and then oh, uh, guess, and it's I a ufo it's book an... and i never say ufo there's never say abduction i never say synchronicity i i purposely tried to make it as i wanted this is going to sound really weird but i wanted people to read the whole book and like it and enjoy it and then not even know that it was about ufos that's oh, brilliant. That's awesome. That's esoteric. That's amazing. Yeah. It's, I it's love that. I don't know if I'm notified. I don't know if I succeeded or not, but that was my goal. So <laughs> it, it's called The Unseen. That was the title. The Unseen, yes. It's the, the title unseen. is The Unseen. Yeah, it just came out. And Everybody the other book go and the, check it out. And the then Unseen gonna, by Mike Bellin. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna start anywhere with the owl stuff, just the first book, The Messengers, would be the place to start. Yeah, I already have a tab open on Amazon. I want to get that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, guys, this was such a thoughtful, very just riveting. I mean, Mike, you're a great storyteller. Yeah, that was incredible. Truly. Thank you and so much for and being as here. good as you are, you know, orally dictating your stories, I imagine you have to be a fantastic writer. So, guys, please check them out, give them some support. We do have a tradition on our show. I know you've seen it because you've seen the show. We like to round out by saying bye, guys. So, if you don't mind uh, completing our ritualistic tradition with us <laughs> on three, one, two, three. Bye guys. Bye, Bye guys. guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more, check out our other videos. And before you go, don't forget to subscribe. See you next week. Peace. Peace.